Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Zachary Microbuzzi. I'm the Arts and Administration Coordinator here at Actors Theatre of Louisville. I'd like to welcome you once again to the 39th Annual Humanist Festival of New American Plays. Um, we have a really exciting panel for you this morning. It's called The Path to Production. Uh, and to give you an introduction for that, I'd like to introduce Megan Carter. She is the director of the uh, Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation.
not what does the director play right really look like, but in your mind, and I think um, you know, of the, with the different writers that you guys have worked with as individual directors, and also in your experience of kind of seeing other work and seeing what that's looked like with other folks, what what does that what does that mean when we say like that was successful or that that relationship went well? Gio, can we, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I, I think for me, um, I've been very lucky in that I've, there are a few playwrights I've worked with numerous times, and uh, part of the reason is there's no question about the mutual level of respect, which is uh, they respect not only that I'm the person who's going to tell their story, I respect their story. We agree upon all of the players who will be telling the story, so that we're in it together. There's never a moment where uh, somebody starts to play the blame game about why something might have gone wrong as it often does when you're doing a new play. I also think uh, you have to be able to ask each other questions and not uh, challenging questions and not feel, not take them personally, not feel disrespected because you're both in it to find the best answer to every question that's posed. And so I think um, healthy discourse healthy uh, healthy conversations and really this feeling that you're in it for each other and that you're in it together is really important. From the beginning, from the outset. Oh, and you can tell instantly if, if that is the relationship you're going to have. You really, you really can. It's like, I guess, speed dating. You need like somebody. Like any healthy, like any healthy <laughs> relationship, right? Like mutual respect seems like something we should have for one another in a relationship. And, um, <laughs> In a healthy relationship, but the, the, the also the sense of um, the I think a measure of its success to sort of answer that part of it is about it, it kind of going the distance in terms of like deepening and becoming more meaningful and um, which really starts at this place of, of trust, of maybe like a shared vocabulary or developing yeah. developing a shared vocabulary or an aesthetic that makes sense. Um, but then there's also the sense of like. Uh, I, I just mean like Ed and I over the past few years have done together is like we'll both like read the same book that has nothing to do with either of us and then kind of like find a way to talk about the work that's not our work and so it's like how can we how, how can we kind of develop that language in a in a broader world that isn't just about the play um, that helps a lot I think. When it's a relationship with someone that might be your first time working with them or you're uncertain so part of it is that new dating experience. And maybe you guys can also articulate a little bit the difference between I'm working with someone for six days in a workshop versus I'm working in the sort of production rehearsal sense. So the designers that are involved, the actors that are involved, the set, the, the stage space, the relationship to the audience, the way you're going to tell the story. Does that differ both in terms of if it's a new relationship versus a long-term one? Because it's great when you keep working together. And then also, how does that differ between truly uh, the, uh, unique development versus we know this is heading into a production and how we're going to work on it? It's about knowing right, the mission statement of what you're setting out to do. Like you're in a six-day workshop, so it's like, what, what is it? What's our goal here? Coming up with that shared goal and then finding a way to do that, and also knowing that just like every director works differently and every actor works differently, every playwright has a different way that they like to work. And so, being part of establishing that mission is like. What's going to be most useful? I mean, especially when you're in a shorter workshop period, that there you're really there to work on the play, right? You're not you're not going necessarily towards production. So it's like, okay, what are the goals? Are we do we want to look at earning the ending? Is it this character's arc, or to really identify what that thing is, and then what are the different ways we're going to go about attacking it? Uh, when I first meet somebody, one of the first questions I ask is, what would make you very happy, and what could I do that would make you very unhappy? <laughs> uh, because I want to make sure that I can please them because it's not fun to show up to work and have a sense that you're disappointing someone. So right off the bat, I always know why I'm, the mission statement not only collectively and artistically, but personally. Because there are playwrights whom I love and respect so much. If they wrote a piece of crap on a napkin and said, will you direct this? I would say, yes, I will. I will direct a piece of crap. And happily, and we will make it shine. Uh, because my, I'm invested in them. Uh, then for other people for whom I don't have that relationship yet, I invest in their story. And I always want to make sure that I want to tell the story they want told. Because I think um, 
what can lead to an unhealthy relationship or an unpleasant developmental experience is if you're, if I'm trying to make something happen that isn't what the playwright wants to have happen, or if I'm disappointed in a turn the story takes. Uh, I have to know why I'm there and who I'm serving, and so that's part of it, is really figuring out the why. Why am I here? What is my job? I think one of the questions, too, and I would be really curious for all of the, the brilliant writers in the room that I'm looking around and seeing, too, is, um, and this obviously varies artist to artist and collaboration to collaboration, and yet when is, because this is as, as a just sort of panel from SDC Foundation, when is, when is it useful for a director to say, I'm not disappointed because I just wish the story were being told differently, but sort of where that dramaturgical relationship happens for a lot of new play directors, and how kind of woven in, what, when do you, not dig your heels in, but when do you say, I, I still hear what you're saying, I will absolutely move the production this way. Um, when, when do you, um, as a collaborator, kind of stick in with it and say, like, I still, here's what I think is happening, and I want to give that to you because I want you to see it, and I also want to still have the conversation. How, did that, how, does the, how do you navigate that? It's tricky. It's sort of, I'm, just, I'm really quickly trying to get to where the tension is, because we can talk a lot about success, I think it's but... Sort of like fail, do it. Fail, do it, do sister. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I mean, it's going to be fail, but, you know... Um, uh, that work done called The Who and the What, which was also written by Ayad Akhtar. This, the, it's a comedy. And we were in a workshop of the, the play, and the first scene was good, and it was working, but the second scene was, like, way funnier. Like, it was just, the second scene was hilarious. The hilarious scene. And so I, and since the scenes in time, chronologically, happen at the same time, I had suggested to Ayad, like, we need to teach, you know, from where I'm sitting, I need to teach the audience how to watch this play, the last play that you did was not a comedy, and so people have come in because they want to see some serious discourse about Islam. And actually, this is a family comedy, and they don't know that. And so the second scene is so funny, and they happen at the same time. Why don't we just flip them? In fact, the two scenes sort of refer to each other. There's like a text conversation that happens so that you know that they're happening at the same time. He was like, well, that's not really the way I wrote it. And I said, but I have to teach the audience how to watch this play. Like, why aren't you listening to me? <laughs> they don't know it's funny, or you need to write more jokes. Um, uh, and, and so we went back and forth about it. He kept sort of talking about, like, well, the music of it. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and um, so eventually I wore him down, because I'm a little unrelenting. <laughs> you know me. Someone must know me. I'm not always funny. Um, but, uh, the, uh, so I wore it down and we tried it out and and I instantly like the scene wasn't even done being right. I was like, it's so much better. And I was so excited about it. And we tried it for a few days and then um, I real I realized, uh, oh I know why this is in the wrong place. Like actually the heart of the story is more important to teach than the comedy of the story. But it, it, it took us kind of trying he wasn't as it was is he wasn't really able to articulate why the scenes need to be in the order they were, aside from like, that's the way that I wrote it and so it made sense to me at the time, which is, of course, a perfectly valid answer. But, and in my effort to try to like shape and craft the best experience possible for our audience, I was like trying to shoehorn something where my focus was on the wrong thing, but that, what I love, what I love about that story is, first of all, that I was wrong, and second of all, <laughs> that, that we tried, we did try it. And that, that's like the best part about it, is that we tried for a few days, and kind of kept talking about it and kept attempting to, and then we, we actually learned something about the play from the exercise, so, right. which was also great. So like he ended up being right, but we needed to do the exercise so that it wasn't a question of right and wrong. Um, it was it was just a question of, like, you kind of, yeah, sort of why that would need to happen that way. Well, I'll, I'll share my uh, failed story. <laughs> um, I, I actually, I'm doing a production right now, and it's with a playwright with whom I've never worked, but who I dearly admire. And she wasn't around a lot in the uh, production. It's In a Word by Lauren Yee. It's an incredibly beautiful play, uh, and very funny. But probably what I should have known is that it's hysterically funny. But that's not how I read the play. 
and it's not how the scenic designer responded to the play. It's about a, a family coping with a child who's gone missing. So we saw the emotion and the beauty in the play and some humor. And when I'd never worked with her before, and she came back um, three days, four days into rehearsal, and uh, was disappointed. And I've never had that. I've never disappointed a playwright. And it was profoundly painful to have to say, what am I, what do you want to see? And then when she described it, to have to say to her, oh, I'm not your girl. That's not what, I can't actually do that with this story. So lucky you, you have a rolling world premiere, so someone will. But what I can show you is this part of your play. I can highlight the heart and the humor that uh, is in bounds for me. And it was, it was a really interesting moment to have to say well, to someone, this is you, what you get. Like about a healthy relationship break, but also like knowing and being able to articulate who you are and what you can bring, like right. what your strengths are. And you're like, this is, this is the way I see yeah. it. This is like what I, and to be able to have that clear conversation is so. Oh yeah, when I tried to please her, it was, um, it was one of those moments where I was like, I think I might be doing 60s feminist theater or something. Like I, this is so not my aesthetic that I actually will kill your play. Like, I would hurt your play, and I, and I said, watch me. I was like, I'll do your scene the way I think you want it. And so she watched, and I went, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> and, it was, and it's interesting, because when the reviews came out, one of the first things, it's a, it's a lovely review, thank God, and our choices were vindicated. However, they do say that we didn't know how to start the play. And they're right. So that was a starting play is really hard. It's Let's really hard. The first ten minutes of any play. I mean, Very that my example too was of the first ten minutes. It's just how do you educate yeah. an audience for what they're going to see, true to the story, and they're not ready to laugh because all of the press material has said it's about a missing child and family coping with this. <laughs> it's really hard to get. A, you would have to prostitute yourself for a laugh that I was just not uh, prepared to do. <laughs> so we all know as audience members, like that's when we're either hooking in or not, and we're probably uber sensitive to that. Like oh yeah, that we know there's such great payoff, but we also know we have to get them. Invested so and let it happen. Honestly, it took every ounce of restraint I had not to sit there at first preview and go. Funny. Just hold up the sign. They'll know to laugh. <laughs> Um, I want to stick sort of in this, in this sort of the, the kind of emotional kind of tenor that you guys are in a little bit, which is to talk about how do you, as a director, and Kimberly and I have talked about this, I think, for about 20 years or longer, um, how do you, as an individual artist, find your voice and kind of place your voice in a process or with a, with a writer on a new play as you're developing in either towards production or not? And in real honest terms, how do you take care of yourself in a relationship in which maybe that play is going to move on and have a huge commercial life? Maybe it's not. And because there's a lot of tenderness yeah. in that relationship, and I think a lot of the tension and how it's manifested itself, as we've seen with different iterations of, well, not unions, but how contracts happen and ownership, that's a real sensitive place in the world of new play development between directors and writers. I'm wondering if you guys can help illuminate for us, sort of, and, and this is again, you know, these are a couple of artist thoughts, so again, please take these and have your own and respond to them and come talk with us and talk amongst each other all weekend long, but how do you, how do you hold yourself there? How do you go for it? My answer is just going to like come from that like sunny optimism land, which is just what's guided my entire really like, career is the like, oh, I'm just going to be here now and I'm just going to do the best work I can on this play, in this moment, in this version, like at this second, and if it's like meant to be, it will be. I mean, that the when um, when I first started directing Disgrace in Chicago in 2011, I was told at the time that just so you know, we're, we're probably going to bring the show to New York, and just so you know, you're probably not going to direct it. And I was like, okay, thanks for letting me know. Why would you hire me? You don't know me. You haven't seen my work. You don't. I mean, we're like in this knew that those were sort of clear saying that, but it was like, this is a new thing, we don't know what it's going to be, so I'm just going to like be here now with the thing and do everything that I can, and who knows what life this play will have. This is the first play this guy ever wrote, 
you know, and it needs some work. And, um, you know, who, who knows what, where, whatever that's going to end up. And so all I can do is just, like, be in this moment. And then to get to move on with the plan, then also to have a production that I didn't direct that happened and to be able to kind of How was that? see what... <laughs> Uh, I think it's I think it's very specific to this play in many ways because I have a like a political agenda with this play about like furthering the conversation of what the content is in American theater that I think Disgrace is achieving in a really cool way that I'm very proud of and so and proud to have been any small part of. So it's this like I love being able to go to London and see the play there and see the convers and be in the lobby and that like no one in the lobby had any idea had anything to do with the play, and just be able to kind of like listen and hear that conversation in another country, and it was quite moving actually. And I also learned just technically about the play, like, oh, there are moments that is exactly how I did that. Like, oh, that must be how that moment works. Because someone completely independent of the conversation we had had, like, came up with that, and then there were other things where I was like, my brain's better. And then there were other things. <laughs> there were other things. And then, but then there were other moments, like the violence I had never really gotten right uh, yet, and the way that the violence was handled there um, was was much better and more effective. And then it made me go back and say to Aya, like, why? And what happened? Where was like our breakdown of conversation about it? And it was almost because he and I were so close, and I was attempting so much to take care of him, and it was a very vulnerable thing for him to put that violence on stage. And so I deferred to him when I should have been, I should have been stronger, and said, like, no, but this is what you wrote, so this is what I'm going to put on the stage, even though what you're giving me is something softer. Um, so, yeah, so love those things. How about for you? Uh, well, early on in uh, my career, I, I got, I think, a very important lesson about losing a play that you spend years of your life working on. Uh, Rajiv uh, Joseph is most well known for Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo. And up until that play, our careers had, um, we were moving along exactly in a parallel career. And I was very naive, and I thought, well, of course that's what happens. And then he wrote Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, and I did two years of development on that piece. And then I learned that I would not be going forward with it. And it was a really interesting moment in my life to go, well, huh. I'm going to have my, so I have, this is where I arrive, at the place where uh, I made a personal decision in my life never to move forward in bitterness. Life is too short. And also, my, I love this man. So truthfully, I'm going to celebrate what my dear friend has done. And I'm going to cry to my sister. <laughs> I'm going to throw, I gave myself two hours of misery, I mean, I'm Italian, so <laughs> it was good. And then, and then I said, what's really important to me? It's not this play, it's this man, it's this playwright, it's this story. And I realized when it was when I went to see it, my biggest fear was not was actually personal, was that I was gonna sit on, in a Broadway theater with a production that Moises Kaufman had directed and go oh shit, I don't know how to do that. And 10 minutes in I went, oh, he's doing a lot of what I did, or I, mine was better, or that's fantastic, I wish I had done that. But it was no different than what I had been doing. And for me, it was an incredible moment in my life as a director when I went, oh, I can play with the big boys. And it doesn't negate your, no. your participation in it. I mean, ultimately, like, Again, Pollyanna speaking, but that there's like a sense of that the work is bigger than we are, and that like yep. that that Bengal tiger that you saw, you're in it, you're imprinted on it in a way that we can't measure or put a dollar value on yep. or understand the intellectual property of or any of those things. But that like just in the same way that actors contribute to yeah, the they, process. they contribute to the process, and then another actor does it, and then they <laughs> take that work and turn it on side and look at it and do it in a new way, and then they add their bit to it and. Like eventually the thing has to like live when the work is great and like what's going to matter down the, road. down the road is that like yeah. we, we've all been a part of this thing that's bigger than any one of our single contributions to it. So it, It's funny because I, in having that lesson so early, I also learned, I, I was amazed at how many people said to me, well, I, I can't believe he did that to you. And I said, what did he do to me? He got in, he, 
you got this fantastic offer, and who would I be to not celebrate that, the play, the story, my friend? And it's so funny because I look back, and if I had, if I had acted in pettiness, my career would be very different because I have done eight shows with Rajiv since then because the relationship, it was bigger than any single show. And, and so anybody in this business loses a show. You, you just do. I think it, part of the paradigm, too, that we just to add in there is what is the position of a playwright in all of this conversation? Because I think for a lot of, a lot of writers, that scarcity of opportunity is huge, huge. and how that relates to dollars yes. and insurance and just actual survival. So what happens in those moments for writers who, I spend a lot of time talking with writers who will come in my office or call me or whatever and say, I need to have a conversation about this because I want to approach this relationship with integrity and I want to appreciate the, and put the respect, the value of the investment of the director in that process. And also what I'm being told is they can't afford, I just, this just, it's happening this weekend. And again, I, I was just texting downstairs. And after having sent flowers, there's a world career of a play happening, opening in 24 hours of a play that I developed for a while that happened at a theater with me down there. And then they said to the writer, uh, we can't afford a director. We have to have an in-house director. So it has to be someone here and you can take it. Or and she went through a battle. And at some point, actually for us, what it was, was the conversation where I said, you're a playwright. You don't have 62 of these opportunities that happen all the time. I am. I couldn't be less interested in holding this up. I appreciate what you've done in putting in work for me. Please go make this play happen. And and as I think you guys are articulating, at the right moment, at the right time, it will happen. It happened like now, and a week later, we got an offer to go do it in DC, which we're doing. And, and it's sort of like, oh, right, there it was. That's all it was. That doesn't always happen, but. Just, I really want to factor the writer into this conversation as well and where that plays is for them. I, I also think that work sometimes gets better the more like people who kind of come in and touch it. Yeah. So like yeah. that writer is like maybe getting something out of this production now, but then when you guys go and do it again, like this other layer will have been brought into it. And you know, we just have to, I mean, look also with, with writers, they, you know, oftentimes they do have like a partnership with the same director that goes on and on and on. But like, I mean, I don't know. Right now, I'm, I'm like, I'm dating a bunch of different writers. You know, so it's like, uh, like it's not, it's not that, that we, it's, it's. There are lots of writers that I'm in rooms with, and that that relationship is not as often singular. Where I feel like sometimes on the other side, um, it is singular. And so that we. I just I, want to say I'm open to dating a lot of writers. <laughs> I don't know any writer who has not agonized over the moment when they have to leave behind a director. And I think it is petty for a director to hold anybody back or make them feel bad about an opportunity they have for their work. It is, it is hard to do, and yet you simply must. And I'm now, uh, I'm the director of New Works um, at TheaterWorks, Silicon Valley, and I'm in the uncomfortable position of having to say, we need a staff director, or I, but when it goes to Broadway, I hope it's the two of you, but I can't do that. And I, and to be on that side of it is really, uh, it's nauseating for everyone involved. It's really, it's it's a very difficult conversation, and you want to be as respectful as you can and as honest as you can. Um, I want to make sure we have time for to get a couple of questions from you guys as well. Um, I, I would just say, was there is there anything if you had kind of looking back? Uh, is there anything that you feel like, and you've shared some of it today, I think, already, but is there anything outside of respect, integrity, <laughs> hubris, <laughs> is there anything else that you feel like you've learned about the relationship because, uh, uh, between not just you as a director, but also directors and writers, because I think we all have a relationship with SDC and with the, and great love and respect for writers, in, in particular around the sort of um, 
<coughs> the traditional way that plays get written and dramaturged and developed. When you're talking about writers, I and mean, I'm looking around the room and also seeing writers who don't, who write for ensembles, or, you know, Greg Moss and the piece that's happening with Big Iron, or Corey Campbell's, you know, I'm looking at writers who also spend part of their career writing with companies and creating work that way. Do you think there's any more or less or different perspective or it shifts the conversation in any way when it's not just I'm the writer or the director, that's how that looks? Oh, completely. Um, I've got a bunch of devised work at NYU and uh, also then shepherded some, and not as a director, but again, kind of facilitating. And I think uh, the conversation is broader how you how inclusive you have to be, how playful you have to be, and also again, um, there has to be a rigorous structure and goal in mind so that there's a container for all this magnificent input. And so I think, um, and not that new plays can't be like that with the actor and designer contributions, but when it's a company, it feels uh, there's such a different level of commitment in the room to the whole. And I think, and I just, I love that kind of work. I can't, I'm so excited to see it over the weekend. Um, yeah, one of the things we talk a lot about, I think, and you were talking about Palo Alto, one of the things that we work a lot uh, uh, at the Player Center, in addition to, you know, sort of making 70 plays a year, but really thinking about what the relationship is between development and production. And I think kind of moving into the next generation of conversation, because I think it can get very static and very stuck. If we don't sort of say, what if we actually came from a place where we assumed that individual artists or institutional artists or whomever and institutions together both wanted the best thing, as you guys are, I think, sharing today. What if we all wanted good for this process? What if we all wanted this to be um, cleaner, more transparent, more clear, more understanding of what ownership looks like? All of the respect and value, I think, that you're talking about. How do we, at the Player Center, I know for us, we constantly have that conversation about how can we connect with what does it mean for the Magic Theater or Cutting Ball to do that in the Bay Area at that budget level versus ACT or Berkeley Rep. I'm just going to be thinking of the Bay Area since you're mentioning for a second. And how do those relationships, where does the institution help and where does it challenge, where does that challenge go? And so really how can we be a hub and a bridge for those conversations between writers and directors and artists? Um, instead of it being just about a play and getting stuck in a machine or a pipeline or God knows all those things. The uncomfortable answer, right, is that every, not only does every playwright like, want to be worked with differently and is their own unique, singular self, but each play requires something different. And so it's so hard because what happens is we, the, the institutional pipeline, all those words, blah, 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 they're trying to find like, a way, a method, a formula, and like it's so, to trust like the intangible and to trust that like sometimes someone writes a draft of a play and it is like ready for production. And sometimes it takes somebody like 11 years and 712 drafts to write a play and both are valid. And sometimes the same playwright that did 712 drafts, their next play, right out of the gate, they sit down, they write it in two weeks, it's done, it's ready to go. And like that's, we have to trust that there's not like a method that you can, that you can put on a thing or a, I mean, I, I remember like just kind of trying to study new play development and reading everything I could and talking to a bunch of directors about it and really wanting to do it and getting into a room with a fantastic playwright, Keith Hoff, who's a, a Chicago playwright, fantastic, amazing, brilliant man who wrote Steady Rain and many, many, many other plays. And we're in there and, and we love each other. We have this great conversation where we're having coffee and it's wonderful. And then we're in the room and I'm like, something's not right. It's not, it's not working. We're not, we're not getting along. And I just finally say to him, like, what is happening here? You know, and he's like, well, when are you going to stop asking me so many questions? And I said, well, as soon as you start collaborating with me. Like, I couldn't, I've been told that, like, asking questions was the right thing to do. And he, you know, he essentially articulated in that conversation to me, like, I wrote something at home alone in my room. And, like, you being able to put it in three dimensions is, is that's all I need right now. Like, I actually don't want to talk about it. I just want to, like, move the thing from here to here. And then we can talk about it. And, and that was different than, like, the player and I worked with prior. And that was a really, like, great, you know, experience. And, you know, I mean, the, and that anecdote is probably, like, 15 years old. And he's still, like, he'll send me a play and be like, I know you're going to have 7 million questions about this play. <laughs> you know? But that was, like, that was really important. 
because I thought that questions were like the magic answer of nuclear development, right? This like, we'll just ask lots of questions. Ask like, you know, just ask questions and make sure that your opinion is not in them. Just a bunch of unbiased <laughs> questions. It's like I would practice them at home, alone in my room, and then... Neutral <laughs> questions practiced in the mirror at home <laughs> and kind of euphemism yeah. are the death of I'm, new plays in the mirror. I'm saving you all a lot. I'm going to name this shit, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I'm actually involved in this struggle personally. As I said, it, I'm new to my role, and so I'm noticing how there is a, a trajectory that makes sense to people with money, to people with buildings, the way they need to see a product and understand that they should invest in it, and then it will go forward. Um, so I, I am right now wondering how else can I do it? What other ways can I serve writers? Uh, and I don't have answers right now because the model that is in place has, it does work for a lot of writers. But a lot, especially I look at who goes through your, uh, your center and who gets lost because then you, you can't quite fit them into that model. So uh, I'm open to ideas and thoughts, and I want to find a way, definitely at TheaterWorks, uh, to serve an artist, to figure out what you need, and then how, what is programming that can allow for that. And it, it is really tricky. If it's really, some writers want to like write and fix stuff in the room. Some writers like need a day off between rehearsals. Right. Some writers are like, we're just going to do five days in a row, and then I'm going to go away for a month. And then everyone has a different kind of the thing is, it, it becomes really complex when the like, someone says, but I need to put a line item down, like how much housing do we need? Like, what do you mean a day off between the thing? Like, I'm going to pay for them to be here for a day, and you're not They're in the hotel room that I'm paying for, and I don't, I don't understand. Like, it becomes, it becomes complicated. It's like, you can't, like, you know, we can't understand, like, the rhythms of the human heart, you know, and then that's, like, that's what this is. It doesn't follow a... A logic, and I think that a lot of what the director's job then becomes is is becoming a translator of attempting to understand like this is the way this process is going to work, and how do we partner with institutions to help make that make sense for them and for their staff, and how do we partner with the other artists working on it to help that make sense. I mean, a lot of it is about you know protecting your playwright's process and and what is it being able to kind of tease out what that is and being ready to know that it's an ever changing thing and being cool with that and... I just want to say too, um, I, I, I realized I forgot to mention at the beginning, both Robert O'Hara and Juliet Carrillo were two of my favorite directors in the world, also were meant to be on this panel, but the storms of the America have taken over the America, and so they are not here, we are not, we're in yeah. Louisville, Kentucky, so uh, they, they're not able to be here, and I have this wish that they were watching it live, like um, some other people, and texting us things like, you didn't talk about this! So, um, I'll leave it to Robert <laughs> yeah, um, Anderson. Um, I, I think, I, 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 we have one more kind of conversation here, and then I would really like to open up to the discussion with, with you all as well. Um, can you share, and again, really specific to you, something that you have learned over time? If you were to sit with someone who's just starting out, they're like, I really want to, I love new plays, and I want to be a new play director. And you're like, great, what does that mean? <laughs> can you think about something that you as a director, or that you've seen other directors do, that is really unique to who you are as artists, or what they've brought to the table, that have shifted the trajectory of a play, or shifted um, a way of thinking for a writer, or a way of how the art has manifested? Something really unique that you have brought to the table. I think I can, but remember I took the red eye. Yes. So I may have lost the thread of your question halfway through. <laughs> really good question. I was the question is, other what's other awesome about question. you? That's what I uh, Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's interesting. My, um, I began my career as an actor, so my MFA is actually in acting from the grad acting program at NYU. And so I think one of the things that I, I, I think I'm a very good translator between the people who will be telling the story and the story a playwright would like told. And uh, I'm pretty good at getting people to play big and bold and quickly so that a writer can see what they have. Uh, and there's one, the, one specific play where I feel like that, what I was able to bring to a play, and knowing 
what my skills are, knowing what I can do. Um, it was the fourth collaboration with uh, Rajiv. So we, mind you, we had now been working uh, together for years. And I really felt my job was to ask questions, but ultimately to do what he wanted, do what he wrote. And during Animals Out of Paper, and I don't know how many of you know Animals Out of Paper, but I, I think it's an incredibly beautiful play, and one of my favorites, and it's actually one of his least favorites of his plays. And he's going to kill me for saying this, and of course I'm going to, is uh, he, he really, maybe now he does, but he really, really didn't know what he had written. He didn't know. It was, it was a more gentle play than he was used to with female protagonists. And he didn't know what he had written. And he kept burdening the lead character. You know, he didn't feel like there was enough drama. So every day he'd come in and he'd get her dog back. And then he'd come in and he'd be like, she lost her job. And I just kept doing it and watching what was happening to the actress. And one day he brought in changes. And for the first time ever in our relationship, I said, yeah, I'm not going to put these in. Um, and then he, he said, what? And then he, that had never happened. And I said, OK, not today, because I don't understand them. Give me a day. So the next day, we rehearsed, and I still didn't put them in. And so afterwards, he said, hey, you didn't put those changes in. And I went, yeah, I don't think I'm going <laughs> to. And he got really angry. And I said, I will tell you what will happen to your actress. You will burden her so profoundly with despair and desperation that you will paralyze her. She, she will have no forward momentum. And your play is beautiful. And I am going to protect you from yourself. And I have, but I would never have said that before that moment. And I earned the right. And those pages never went in that play. Never. And to prove my point, once we were in previews, I just said to the actress, what would you think if your character, and I listed them, and she went, oh my god, that would just, I mean, why would I even get up in the morning? <laughs> and so that's a, that is the moment where I, I look at a beautiful play that's out there and think, oh, good, I, I, I protected his story. Yeah. I love that. It's unfortunate we're not honest and clear with each other. Why would I even get up in the morning? <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> shy. So to be unclear. Yeah, there's something about, because you had said as part of the question, like, what would you say to someone who's starting out? And I would say, like, speak up. Because, because it is true, right, that when you're working on new work, it, it, is, it is kind of that key pop thing of, like, I had a thing in this dimension, and you're going to make it in this one. And we want to kind of see that thing, that this playwright had this amazing, you know, uh, Richard Nelson, a great address, he talked about, like, playwrights don't write words, they write plays, and that that is, I think, a really important distinction about, like, they're not just responsible for the text, right? There's a whole play, there's a whole world there that we're there to sort of help realize and facilitate and shepherd and nurture and get crutches on and do all that. So, but, but the thing about speaking up is that we, you also have your unique perspective that comes from you and only you. I mean, and I'm particularly struck with like a female character and that you're a woman and maybe that, that was like something you had insight into and that the, the opportunities where I found that I have trusted my instinct to suggest something opposite or different, again, this to an earlier question too, you had about where the tensions lie. Like, I find that I actually do work best with people who come from a, we have enough things in common that we believe that makes work great, but that who we are is actually kind of different so that we're able to um, kind of have that and be like, oh, well, actually, the way that I see this is this, and I might not always be right, but to be able that. No one can be wholly like the expert or the master of every single moment of everything. Yourself, the actor playing the role, the playwright. We all need perspective on our lives, just like we seek that from our friends and our families and our spouses and our children. That like, and to know that you're still in a vital place where you can perhaps offer just that key or another way of looking at something that's going to actually take the play in a, in a really marvelous direction. I'd love to open this up um, to you all to see if you have any questions or thoughts or kind of response to it, but in particular for, for, for this panel of folks. And Zach is going to be going around with the microphone, so stand up, raise your hand, and he'll come to you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I'm wondering when uh, you need to stop getting new pages. When you're looking at production and the playwright says, this character is not arcing enough, I need to give her another monologue, blah, blah, blah. And when are the actors who 
it's in my experience that actors don't like to change that much close to the production. Yeah. I think, oh, go ahead. I think that's a really tricky, again, I think each situation is different. Um, I myself, I mean, there's a moment when press comes when you freeze. So I, I always, I like to set a date where you say, let the actors take it. Let everybody take it. But it's a mutually agreed upon date. Um, but I, it, I know certain playwrights well enough now to say, you have until this day. And other playwrights, I say, I think let's stop a few days earlier. Let me catch up to you. Let the actors catch up to you. But I always think there has to be a few days, if possible, depending on your rehearsal and preview period, where it's just left alone. Yeah, because um, otherwise no one will ever own it. And so I think it is very important to have that period. Yeah, I would agree it's a day to play freezes, but I, I think in response to the, like, the change thing, it's also about starting out at like, the very first day saying, we're a new play development. This is like a kamikaze, free for all, like chaotic, go with the flow. This play is like a living thing that's gonna like take on a life of its own. And so like it may turn left when you want to turn right, and we're just gonna have to either figure out how to wrangle it or just go with it, or you know, and sort of like kind of create the environment where those things are always. I, mean, I told Jeremy the story earlier about um, with disgrace in its third year of new play development. After it had already won the Pulitzer Prize, like this is a play that we continued working on to the day the play grows. Wow. We were in rehearsal that afternoon. At the end of rehearsal, I was like, all right, well. Wait, what afternoon were you in rehearsal? The last preview? The, the, no, it was, so there, it was the day the play froze. Okay. So there were still to be like four more previews before opening, which is when the press would come over that weekend. And so we were, it was, so we had rehearsal till like, you know, five, and then we're gonna clear the stage, open up dinner, and then we're gonna show back up at, 7.20 for fight call or whatever it was. And so we're leaving out like, so that in our relationship is changing now. And we're not gonna be like up on the stage making changes and doing this stuff, but we'll still be talking about our experience of the previews and we'll still kind of, we're just gonna change the relationship a little bit. And um, those pesky first 10 minutes, right? So then I'm walking around the city and I'm pounding the pavement with my headphones in and just, I don't know, thinking about how does this become my life and is this exciting? And then <laughs> you have those moments. And then I realized that uh, the play did not need the first eight lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, 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 this is all true. So I called Three Anne. years in, yeah. on Broadway, yeah. the press freeze. In the last, I mean, in fact, I had already like, been given my restraining order, you know? And so I, so I called Anne. I'm like, Anne, Anne, who had like abandoned coming to previews like weeks earlier, because yeah, he's just done. not there, watching this one more time. And, um, so I called him and I said, hey, you know how we've never been able to get the first 10 minutes of the play right? You know how like this has been where we put literally 60% of our rehearsal energy over three years? I just figured out what it is. We don't need the first eight lines. And I explained to him why and uh, there were a bunch of reasons. And he was like, okay, we'll try it. I was like, you gonna come by? And he was like, nope. And I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he was like, I'm going to the gym or something. I was like, all right. <laughs> so, so I show up at the theater fight call, and they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, there she is at the fight call. Yeah, she's on the stage again, you know. And, um, you know I thought we took away her little stairs. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got up there, I'm like, hey guys. <laughs> you know we've never gotten the first time, so they're right. It's because we need to cut the first eight lines. And they're like, cool, okay. I was like, so just do that tonight. <laughs> they're like, are we going to practice that? And I was like, well, I don't have any more rehearsal hours. <laughs> the stage manager was like, I, I think you guys could probably just run the lines right now. And I'm like, okay. What's interesting yeah. about both of these responses, I think, to the question is that they, uh, and then both when you're yeah. talking about that moment for you too, is that it speaks to the long term investment with an, uh, between artists that, that you've earned a certain place to do. But, and also the actors were like, yeah, because yeah, like, they had been a part of trying to solve that problem with us. Like, you know, we spent days, hours, solutions. Yeah. I think there should also be a whole panel, not only actors who do new work, because we have this incredible community of Penn City, but on stage managers. Oh, who stage
Uh, you talked about developing relationships with playwrights. Um, do you actively seek out to try to develop relationships with new writers you haven't had before? And say, if you find a play you really like, whatever, how you, you went to a reading or somebody recommended you read it, if you really like it, do you then try to initiate a production of that play yourself, or do mostly you get hired to do stuff? Um, all of the above. Kind of all of the above. Um, definitely, I'm always seeking uh, out playwrights, new plays. If I see a play I love, I'll, you know, as a director, I, I want to be very respectful about who directed it and their relationship. Uh, so that's always a tricky thing. But I approach the playwright and say, I love your work. I love this play. I'd love to, um, I'd love to take it to theaters once this has run its course, when it's open for other productions. Uh, something like that, because I know, I mean, I can walk into parties with certain playwrights and walk, it's like sharks circling them. <laughs> and um, now I'm comfortable enough that it doesn't bother me, but I used to notice that. I'd go, oh, look at everybody coming over here. Um, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Um, but, you know, if I have a play I love, I always ask permission from the playwright to say, I, I have a great relationship with blank theater. I'd love to take your play. May I do that? So, to, to me, I just always keep that dialogue open. Yeah. Uh, Two part question. <coughs> Obviously, the new plays, not Gibson, Chekhov, Shakespeare, but relatively new plays. But for whatever reason, the playwright isn't going to be around during your whole production of it, uh, pre opening. Um, that's and, and how do you deal with that when, in fact, you feel you need to drop the first eight lines or other fairly significant changes you feel are important? Second question is, what do you do, again, playwrights either there or not there, and you've got, and we all have them, those kinds of actors who say, you know, I just think that my dog should die in the first half, or, and so on. And, and so you're dealing with an actor or more than one actor who's being very, very obstreperous about his or her role. Well, you know what, if if the playwright is, is living, even if they're even if it's like the eighth production of their play, I found that they're really always open to, you know, hopping on the phone with you or exchanging an email or like I just directed a play by Gina Jane Frito called Rack for Blister Burn, and Gina and I like met up and had a couple meals, and she was available for questions by email, and that was, and she became this amazing resource and partner. I mean, she wasn't working on the play anymore, so, but that there, that that relationship can continue, and I, I actually think um, that that's really exciting for playwrights to continue to sort of see the play as a living thing out in the world, because as the world changes and as new people come in and begin interpreting the work, that, that it, it continues to keep the thing alive. Like, no one wants their play in a glass case, you know, preserved for antiquity. I mean, you said Ibsen and Shakespeare and Chekhov, and I'm like, they all wrote new plays too, right? Like, you know, so it's like that that's, there's that kind of attitude about it. And in terms of the actor, I mean, that's like a totally, almost different conversation. That's like actor management is a whole other, <laughs> yeah. a whole other thing. But I, think, but I think in terms of the actor suggesting something, that, that it's um, a plan in rehearsal for right now called Inanna by Michelle Lowe has had a couple of productions. And when I was slated to direct it, you know, I, I was like, I love this play and I want to do this play. And when Michelle and I first spoke, we had this really lively dialogue. And I said, you know, I, I signed up to direct your play as it is, and I love it. I also have a couple of thoughts, and if you want them, I'm happy to share them. But also, we can just totally ignore the part of the conversation before I love your play so much and I can't wait to do it. And she, we ended up having, she written a play like five years ago, and she's changed, and world events have changed, and so then we, she ended up coming in for the first week of rehearsal and just sent me pages yesterday, and like, and a lot of that was, and then when she'd come in for rehearsal, she met the actors who were doing it and was like, oh, now that I hear this actor's voice, I kind of, I kind of want to, is it okay with you if I change this scene too, even though we didn't talk about it? And so I mean, I think that there's a lot of positives that can grow out and I feel like I keep using the phrase living thing, but I really mean it, right? Like that's what the gift of, the play's a living thing each night because the audience is different. So to, to kind of keep that spirit of the thing and let that in, be infused through everyone that's working on it, I think helps keep those conversations positive. 
Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, way up there. Oh, we have time for, yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't fight, I don't know, one of you, yeah, yeah, do it, do it, go for it. Hi, my name is Eric. I was wondering, um, in your experience, what uh, skills, professional, professionalism, tools, uh, have you found most productive or valuable in actors uh, to support your relationship as an intermediary with the playwright, assuming that playwright's still alive? So the question is, what tools do I look for in an actor? Oh, I call it the Sadowski effect. Yeah. Tommy Sadowski. Uh, what I look for in most of the playwrights I work with who tend to write very broad, not broad, but very theatrical shows, I like brave actors. I like actors who walk in and say, yes, I'll try that. I, you, I watch how actors work. If they mess up a line, if something goes wrong, I like to see somebody go, oh, that was terrible, I'm gonna start again. Because that, that's how you'll be working with them. So I think uh, somebody who's flexible, brave, says yes, um, is fun, thinks, is curious and engaged, so they're hungry for an answer, I think is, is huge, and then transformational. Really, somebody who, um, there's so many fantastic actors like that. Mostly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are the ones who like, wait, 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 very, you know, like this character must have this flavor, or you're you're playing either with very specific or very broad strokes, and so part of it is the job of the moment. But it's true. This is what, I mean, my experience of actors is this is what you get most of the time. And a partner, and a participant, and like a completely, yeah. I think wanting that dialogue is going back to this question too. I mean, I I know that I'm I'm going to conclude this now. Uh, uh, I just say that like I remember because we're here at Louisville, I remember doing a show at the theater across the hall, and um, it, the, every single day was not just the actors that were cast you know, out of New York, but also all the acting apprentices that were part of the show, and I kept saying, can I add you into the show? Can, can, can I, who can juggle? Who can yeah. play the ukulele? Who feels like they can swing from a rope vine? Yeah. Who will get off their cell phone and just run across the stage and jump over each other? And if we just got as many people involved as possible because it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the Sally Wingerts and the Tommy Sadowskis and the people that have been doing it for all these years and making new work, or you're someone who's 22 and figuring it out. Bold and uh, the ability to just be present. I'm going to come back to that end with Kimberly's Be Here Now. I think we're so lucky in this field to have so many artists who predominantly are all saying, I just want to be here now. Yeah. I just want to be in this moment. And I think that's why we're all here this weekend. I'm really excited to um, take this out of this room and share the conversation going forward. So I just want to thank Giovanna Sardelli, Kimberly yeah. Senior, and all of you. Nice to meet y'all.